Bhutan and worldwide heads of state congratulate Luis Ignacio Lula da Silva after his victory in Brazil's presidential elections. Tensions continue in Bolivia as Santa Cruz authorities and government supporters in the region keep vying over a strike that has severely affected the economy of the region and the country. Russian President Vladimir Putin leads a trilateral summit with Armenia and Azerbaijan leaders in the city of Sochi amid expectations that a peace agreement will be signed between the parties. From the headquarters of Telesur English in Havana, Cuba, this is From the South. I'm your anchor, Gladys Quesada. And now we begin with the news. In Brazil, with more than 50% of the votes, Luis Ignacio Lula da Silva wins this Sunday's presidential runoff election. As reported by country Superior Electoral Court, with more than 99.99% .99 of the votes counted, the Workers' Party candidate received 50.90% of the votes, surpassing current president and candidate for the re-election, Jair Bolsonaro, who obtained 49.10% of the votes. Thus, Lula da Silva wins her third presidential victory and will lead the country for the 2023-2026 term. Addressing the nation, President-elect Luis Ignacio Lula da Silva spoke about the priorities of his government, such as the health sector education, as well as women workers and rural sector's rights. People show today that we want more than they want of the sacred right who is going to govern their life. They want to participate act actively of the decisions of the government. The Brazilian people show today they want, want more than one, that they right than the protest, that they are hungry, there are no, no jobs, the salary is not enough to be with dignity, they have access to health, education, it is like uh, a, ceiling, a ceiling to live security without perspective of future. The Brazilian people, they want, want to eat well, to pray well, I want job, I want a, a, third, a third job, a third salary about inflation, not that about inflation and uh, quality, political quality. During his speech, President-elect Luis Ignacio Lula da Silva emphasized that democracy is the real winner of these elections and is a big victory for the Brazilian people. One instrument to improve the life of everybody and not and not for uh, not for inequality. The economy is going to around go grow again to to uh, a growth in salary and dignity for people. They lost they lost the power of purchase. The economy will is going to to round again part of the budget with s support of middle and rural people and small people and the food that comes coming to, to feed our us, all the incentive possible to the micro and small <coughs> uh, workers that they can put their extraordinary creative potential to serve it to the develop to the develop of the country is necessary to go further to strengthen the politics to fight violence against women and they want to win the same salary in their jobs, making the same job. Several heads of state and government took to Twitter to congratulate President-elect Luis Ignacio Lula da Silva. The president of Venezuela, Nicolás Maduro Moros, posted on his official account, we celebrate the victory of the Brazilian people, who this October 30th elected Luis Ignacio Lula da Silva as their new president. Long live the people determined to be free, sovereign, and independent. Today in Brazil, democracy triumphed. Congratulations, Lula, a big hug. Also on his official Twitter account, the president of Cuba, Miguel Diaz-Canel, celebrated Lula's victory, and the Cuban president wrote, Dear brother Lula, I congratulate you on behalf of the Cuban government and the people who celebrate your great victory in favor of unity, peace, and Latin American and Caribbean integration. Always count on Cuba.
The president of Bolivia, Luis Arce, joined the celebrations. President Arce tweeted, Congratulations, Brother Lula da Silva, elected president of Brazil. Your victory strengthens democracy and Latin American integration. We are sure that you will lead the Brazilian people along the path of peace, progress, and social justice. The Secretary General of the Bolivarian Alliance for the Peoples of Our America, People's Trade Treaty, Alba TCP, Sasha Lorenti, acknowledged the participation of the Brazilian people in the recent election. He also tweeted, We salute the democratic participation of the fraternal Brazilian people in this Sunday's elections. We congratulate Lula on his electoral victory. The tweet reads, Latin America and the Caribbean see with hope the participation of Brazil in the integration processes that cannot be postponed. Leaders from Africa, Asia, and Europe have expressed their congratulations to Luis Ignacio Lula da Silva, elected president of Brazil. After the result, Norwegian Prime Minister Jonas Garstor announced his country will resume aid against deforestation in the Amazon. For his part, the president of South Africa, Cyril Ramaphosa, expressed his admiration and affection for the progressive leader and his people. So did the highest authorities of the Eurogroup institutions, Charles Michel, head of the European Council, and highlighted the will for change of the Brazilians, and his colleague, Ursula von der Leyen, president of the Commission, expressed her wishes to carry out joint tasks. Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishi Shira ratified the will to work together with his strategic global partner. And the president of Argentina, Alberto Fernandez, left on Monday for Sao Paulo, Brazil, to meet with Luis Ignacio Lula da Silva, the winner of the presidential elections in that country. Fernandez pays his visit to Lula, accompanied by the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Santiago Cafiero, and other top government officials, as well as authorities from the Frente de Todos party. Fernandez invited Lula to his inauguration on December 10, 2019, among other political leaders of the region, and now he is traveling directly to Brazil to meet again with the now elected president. In this framework, Alberto Fernandez stressed that Lula's inauguration as president of Brazil on January 1, 2023, will help to unite the continent again. We'll take a short break now, but first, remember you can follow us on our TikTok account at Telesur English, in which you will be able to see news in different formats, news updates and more. Other stories coming up, stay with us. Welcome back to From the South. In Bolivia, Presidency Minister Marianela Prada denounced personal threats in the midst of tensions in Santa Cruz for a strike that has severely affected the economy of the region and the countries. Minister Prada said on Sunday that photos of her family home and her address are circulating through WhatsApp groups, along with the message, go lay a hand on her, which she regards as fascism and believes it's coming from the people linked to Governor Fernando Camacho. Prada said Governor Camacho is prone to issue threats. She said people linked to the strike, called on by Camacho and Romulo Galvo, made her aware of the messages by calling to her house and to that of her family. But she says that they will neither intimidate her nor her family. They have sent to my family these messages that are circulating in WhatsApp groups, as you can see here where they are giving the address of my house, the address where my family lives here in Santa Cruz, so that violent groups move to my home, to where my family lives. And again, here I show it, this is not the only group where they are circulating these kinds of things, where they are giving the address of my house. 
Heading journalist Rommel Zonvizant died on Sunday from gunshot wounds caused by national police agents in front of the Delmas 33 station while protesting the arrest of a colleague in Port-au-Prince, the capital of the country. According to press reports, Vilzant went to the facility along with another group of citizens to protest the detention of Radio Zenith reporter Robes Dimanche. Police forces attempted to violently disperse the crowd and during the events several colleagues were injured, including Vilzant, who died hours later in a city hospital. Numerous civil organizations, such as the Group Action for the Strengthening of Human Rights, condemned the murder and demanded an investigation of the events. Vilzant becomes the sixth journalist killed this year in Haiti. A few months ago, the United Nations Integrated Office in the Nation stated that from 2000 to date, 19 journalists had been murdered, making it a worrying situation. On Sunday, Ecuador's National Assembly challenged President Guillermo Lasso once again by ratifying the three articles of the communication draft bill that the president had vetoed. The articles, ratified in their original version and not as intended by the president, promote the creation and strengthening of community media directed and administered by social organizations, communes, indigenous peoples and nationalities, Afro-Ecuadorians, Montubio people, and asylum seekers historically discriminated. In this way, the assembly members voted for the protection of the right to freedom of expression. According to Pasha Kurig lawmaker Mario Ruiz, it is necessary to halt currently existing monopoly and oligopoly. Now we move on to other topics. In the Dominican Republic, 11 communities were reported isolated due to heavy rains that lashed the territory. The Emergency Operations Center of the Dominican Republic reported that 150 people were evacuated in the provinces of Altagracia and San Pedro de Macorís. The center also decreed a yellow alert in the capital Santo Domingo and several neighboring provinces. Firefighters said that the rains caused the Yauya Creek to rise, causing the collapse of the Linea Nueva bridge of the Hiway Michis Highway, affecting telecommunications. In the Philippines, the death toll caused by tropical storm Pine rose to 98 in the last few hours, according to a un an updated report from the National Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Council. Tropical storm Pine hit the country over the weekend, with Category 3 leaving it with severe flooding and landslides due to the heavy rains. The report, published on Monday, ensures that more than half of the disease belong to the autonomous region of Bang Samoro in the southwest of the country and that 58 of them are already confirmed, while the other 40 are still being validated. Authorities continue searching for 63 missing people, another 105,000 remain evacuated to safe locations and 590,000 families have been affected. The Disaster Management Agency insists that the authorities carry out intense search and rescue work to recover the bodies, locate the citizens, and evacuate families in vulnerable situations. Uh, and we have more news coming up after a final short break, so stay with us. Welcome back to From the South. On Monday, Russian President Vladimir Putin leads a trilateral Russia-Azerbaijan-Armenia summit in the city of Sochi. Russia's Deputy Foreign Minister Andrei Rudenko pointed out that Russian premises will host the meeting between Putin, his Azerbaijani counterpart Ilham Aliyev, and the Armenian Prime Minister Nikol Pashinyan. At the negotiations, the leaders will discuss the problems accumulated in recent months, which threaten to continue the escalation of the Armenian-Azerbaijani conflict. Moscow will also try to reach a commitment between Yerevan and Baku to avoid future wars and to ensure peace between 
between the two sides to create a certain legal status for Nagorno-Karabakh. So far, Minister Nikol Pashinyan announced the readiness of Armenia to sign the peace agreement. Now we address other topics. On Monday, once again, several cities in Ukraine are shaken by the sound of explosions and shelling alerts. The governments of Kiev, Poltava and Vinitsa, as well as other areas of the country, report explosions after the air alert was heard all over the territory. The advisor to the Ministry of Interior of Ukraine, Anton Gerashenko, confirmed that at least 40 missiles in fact have been reported on Monday morning. In Kiev, the capital of the country, they confirmed that more than 50 percent of the city is under a blackout. The military report refers to attacks with Russian C-300 systems aimed mostly of power installations. Amid high regional tensions, the United States and South Korea have begun their first large-scale military exercises in five years. The United States and South Korea have begun their first large-scale military exercises dubbed Vigilant Storm, which according to the U.S. Defense Department are intended to dissuade North Korea and its missile tests. South Korea is contributing 140 military aircraft, including stealth fighters. The U.S. sent 100 aircraft, stealth fighters, electronic warfare fighters, and several reconnaissance ships. The maneuvers will be joined by Australia with a KZ-38 tanker aircraft. The joint military program started in 2015, igniting challenges to the northern neighbor despite its numerous calls to respect its sovereignty and security. South Korean President Yoon suk yeol on Monday opened the memorial shrine for the 154 people killed in a Halloween party stampede as authorities face accusations that a lack of police control led to disaster. At a makeshift memorial next to a subway station in the popular Itaewon district, where the tragedy occurred, people stopped to pray and leave flowers. Meanwhile, media and social networks began broadcasting growing calls for accountability as failures in crowd control became known. As many as 100,000 people, mostly young and many in Halloween costumes, flocked to the small windy alleys of Itaewon, with witnesses citing a lack of security and crowd control. Police said on Monday they dispatched 137 officers to the site, a number they noted was higher than in previous years, but local reports indicated the police dispatched were more focused on police in drug use than the crowd control. On late Sunday, Ghanaian President Nana Akufoado outlined measures to halt the depreciation of the Ghana Zerai as he blamed the COVID-19 pandemic and the conflict in Ukraine for the country's economic hardships. Akufoado also blamed currency speculators and unlicensed currency dealers dubbed as black market operators for the recent sharp fall in the value of the Ghana Zerai. According to the Bank of Ghana's October official report, the national currency had depreciated by 37.5% between January and August this year and is listed as the world's wor worst performing currency against the U.S. dollar. Announcing a raft of measures to address the crisis, the president said the government will maintain a 30% cut in the salaries of the president, vice president, ministers and other government appointees, while Ghana is also negotiating a 3 billion IMF bailout program. We must, as a matter of urgent national security, reduce our dependence on imported goods and enhance our self-reliance, as demanded by our arching goal of creating a Ghana beyond aid. Much as we believe in free trade, we must work to ensure that the majority of goods in our shops and marketplaces are those we produce and grow here in Ghana. And we have come to the end of this news brief. But remember, you can find this and many other stories on our website at telesurienglish.net. And also, if you feel so inclined, please join us on social media for all the latest news. We are on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Telegram, and TikTok. For Telesur English, I'm Gladys Quesada. Thank you for watching.